Good evening, fellow STC pediatricians. It is my honor to be your speaker for tonight. And because several societies have already discussed topics about pulmonary tuberculosis, smoking, vaping, pneumonia, and asthma, respiratory tract infections practically are being discussed during the long month. The Committee on Tobacco and Nicotine Awareness Advocacy, headed by yours truly, together with the dependable members, Drs. Dina De Castro, Marlene Aureliano, George Mar Maravillosa, and Dr. Karen Santos, together with our dynamic PPS STC president, Dr. Lisette Pontanilla, we have agreed to give a lecture on respiratory problem prevention in children. This topic may be uh, very familiar to most of us, but we feel that this could be a very good avenue for everyone to review and emphasize the old and new concepts of respiratory disease prevention. This picture has gone viral during the start of pandemic, wherein Ms. Sheena Halili have practically wrapped her child and herself as they go out of their condo unit because of fear of contracting COVID. And um, to most parents, they actually emphasize with her and uh, to really feel what they have, what Ms. Halili have felt during those times. And as pediatricians, we do understand those concerns, the concerns of our patients, their parents and caregivers. And hopefully this lecture will make you more confident on what to advise them. The objectives of this lecture are the following, to discuss concepts of disease prevention, to review present local and international statistics on pediatric diseases, and to briefly review the development of respiratory system, enumerate strategies on prevention of childhood respiratory problems. Before we begin, I would like to define this is prevention. Based on WHO, this covers measures not only to prevent the occurrence of the disease, such as risk factor reduction, but also to arrest its progress and reduce its consequences once established. And successful prevention depends on the following. Knowledge of causation, dynamics of transmission, identification of risk factors, and the who among these people are at risk for the specific um, condition, availability of prophylactic or early detection and treatment measures, and facilities for treatment procedures, and also evaluation and development of treatment procedures. All of these things has been tackled with us during our medical school days. And as a review, the five levels of application of preventive medicine, number one is health promotion, specific protection, just like what we're doing with COVID-19. All the necessary informations are being given but in the media, uh, even in different forms of media, actually, and to make the people aware how this disease actually affects or transmits, other to, uh, transmits to other people. Also, early recognition and prompt treatment, disability limitation, and also rehabilitation. Pediatric acute infections of the airways continue to play an important role worldwide. And the burden of disease uh, is being reflected by the high incidence. Based on the Our World data in 2019, the number one cause of death in children under five is still lower respiratory infections, followed by neonatal preterm birth. And uh, additional to the high incidence, 
substantial morbidity and potential sequelae can happen, tendency of overdiagnosis, especially in streptococcal pharyngitis and otitis media, and also associated overuse or misuse of antibiotics and other relevant contribution to healthcare costs and indirect societal costs. In the Philippines, the number one cause of death in children under five is neonatal preterm birth, followed by lower respiratory infections. The high incidence of RTI in young infants and preschool children is explained by the increased exposure to respiratory pathogens by the siblings and in a child care. The pandemic has really struck us, the practice of pediatricians, because we have really a remarkable decrease in our patients because Number one, advantage din naman yun because they don't get uh, sick more often as compared to uh, the pre-pandemic. Uh, another thing is that less exposure to their playmates, of course. Remember the transmission of these um, infections. Again, another is the environmental factors as well and the defects in the immune system. Although RDI remains to be the most common cause of morbidity in children, we also have to emphasize the congenital anomalies that may happen and which can affect the growth of the child. Thus, mothers-to-be should be educated before conception. The health promotion in every encounter is very important. Although preconception this is under the care of family physicians, OBGYN, or maybe an internist. Uh, we could also get involved as pediatricians. Like for example, uh, the mother or the mother of our child would like to conceive again. So preconception, mothers should be counseled on pregnancy preparation, emphasize on the importance of appropriate and adequate nutrition and activities to strengthen the immunity, such as exercise also, and also disease prevention. Necessary immunizations uh, should be uh, taken prior to conception. And during pregnancy, we have to discuss that psychological, emotional, and nutritional support are very crucial. And during the counseling, we should involve the partner or the father of the mom. Advice on the identification of teratogens and its possible complications. And the goal, of course, is to deliver the baby to term. In the event the baby is delivered as a preterm, discuss the importance of antenatal steroids and surfactants. This is a schematic representation of the respiratory development. And I would just like, at this point in time, I would like to review the different periods of lung development. The first is the embryonic period at three to six, three to six weeks, and the pseudoglandular followed by the canalicular, saccular, and alveolar period. So what do I would like to emphasize here? Infants who are exposed to teratogens during the first trimester are at risk to develop congenital anomalies that may affect vital organs, such as the respiratory system. These are the examples of teratogens associated with human malformations. They have infectious agents, chemical agents, there could be physical agents, and even maternal conditions that can affect the developing embryo. And it is interesting to note that isotretinoin or vitamin A, a solution that is often used for beautification, skin peeling, can lead to severe congenital formations such as vitamin A embryopathy, which is characterized by small baby, abnormally shaped ears, mandibular hypoplasia, cleft palate, and heart defects. So if the moms of our patients are using this, we should be uh, guiding them that if they use isotretinoin, it is their responsibility to avoid pregnancy a month before, during, and even a month after their treatment. I know that every one of us are very familiar with the infectious agents because um, nowadays we have uh, several cases of viral exanthems 
I personally have experienced uh, German missiles uh, last month. And um, of course, we have to be careful uh, with the when in dealing with other uh, other persons, especially the uh, moms who are con uh, who have just conceived. So we have to explain the effect of exposure to rubella virus, cytomegalovirus, varicella virus, and so on. And another common uh, thing that we give as an example as a as a risk factor to develop um, human malformation is the exposure to radiation. And also the intake of alcohol. We should emphasize that uh, they could have patients or babies with fetal alcohol syndrome. And the worst thing about it is that it could lead to mental retardation. So after birth, what can we do? There are a lot of strategies that we can um, share to our parents uh, in preventing respiratory tract infections in children because it is during this time after birth that the possibility of infections do set in. So I will be discussing this one by one. Parent education is the number one strategy in order to help the whole family, the entire family with regards to disease prevention not only respiratory infections. So we have to discuss normal prevalence, enumerate the common respiratory conditions that can affect their children and explain the possible sequelae and complications. So the more common, common ones now, nowadays are the upper respiratory tract infections such as influenza. And also we still have COVID or SARS-CoV-2. I've had several missiles, pneumonia, pulmonary tuberculosis, and explain that crowded conditions such as those found in daycare settings favors the colonization and spread of pathogens using respiratory tract infections. What about familial predisposition, predisposition what that is mean? It is a risk factor for recurrent and severe disease. This genetic predisposition mean, uh, seems to be associated with anatomical, physiological and immunological features. This refers also to genetic susceptibility to a disease which can be triggered by particular environmental or lifestyle factors such as tobacco smoking or diet. Genetic testing can provide a diagnosis of genetic conditions such as cystic fibrosis, fragile X syndrome, Down syndrome, and even information about an individual's risk to cancer. So if we happen to, to find out during the history taking that they have this mm, family history, maybe we can offer several tests for them. Uh, genetic uh, testing include molecular tests, chromosomal analysis, gene expression, and even biochemical tests. Risk factor modification. Environmental risk factors include absence of breastfeeding, arsenic exposure or poisoning, which has recently been observed in towns surrounding the Al volcano, exposure to pollutants and tobacco smoke are just some of the risks that I can give as an example. Thus, if you are a clinician, you should be able to ask and advise or even may offer help to quit if there is any indication of tobacco and nicotine exposure. This is a very good illustration of the different types of tobacco smoke exposure. First-hand smoke inhaled by the smoker himself, second-hand smoke exhaled by the smoker or released from the end of a burning cigarette. Third-hand smoke, toxic residue that sticks to the surfaces and dusts after the smoke clears. Why prevention is crucial. It is vital that pediatric healthcare clinicians routinely address tobacco and nicotine use among patients and their families. We should have a systematic strategy to prevent initiation by non-users and to promote cessation among, non, uh, among users and explain to them the health consequences that can happen to patients who have been exposed to secondhand smoke. In children, we may observe re recurrent middle ear diseases, respiratory symptoms, impaired lung function, lower respiratory illnesses, and even sudden infant death syndrome. Studies show that older children whose parents smoke 
get sick more often, and their lungs grow less than children who do not breathe secondhand smoke. And they even have uh, more bronchitis and pneumonia. They can also experience wheezing and coughing. Secondhand smoke can also trigger asthma attack. And we know that um, severe asthma attack can put a child's life in danger. Children whose parents smoke around them will have recurrent ear infections. Thus, this would be equated to more operations to put in uh, ear tubes for drainage. Smoking by women during pregnancy increases the risk of SIDS and infants who are exposed to secondhand smoke after birth are also at greater risk for SIDS. Chemicals in secondhand smoke appear to affect the brain in ways that interfere with its regulation of infants breathing. And uh, it has been observed that infants who die from SIDS have higher concentrations of nicotine in their lungs and they have higher levels of cotinine than infants who die from other causes. By the way, cotinine is a biological marker for secondhand smoke exposure. We should be able also to discuss natural course of the disease with or without the use of an antibiotic. We should be able to explain that viral infections in the normal host are usually self-limited as, as the innate and acquired immune systems mount successful antiviral responses. Explain when is the indication of an antibiotic in a particular condition. Vaccines ultimately represent the best opportunity to reduce the morbidity and mortality associated with pediatric respiratory tract infections. And we would like to thank PITSP, of course, for the child immunization schedule for 2022. According to WHO in 2015, pneumonia can be prevented by immunizing against Haemophilus influenza type B, pneumococcus, measles, and pertussis. Pneumococcal conjugate vaccine was also recommended by WHO to be included in children's immunization all over the world. Substantial reductions in hospital admissions for bacterial meningitis and pneumonia in England were estimated after the introduction of childhood pneumococcal vaccination. Of course, we cannot discount the importance of adequate nutrition and breastfeeding. Nutrition, including breastfeeding for the first six months of life, plays a major role by boosting immunity against causative organisms of pneumonia. It has been demonstrated that breastfeeding can reduce the risk of pneumonia in children up to 32%. What about chemoprophylaxis? Antibacterial chemoprophylaxis is currently only seldom necessary. This is based on the prevention of recurrent respiratory infections inter-society consensus from the Italian Journal of Pediatrics. They said that the advantage is negligible and there is a genuine risk that resistant microorganisms will arise due to the antibacterial drugs um, effect. Of course, um, contrary to this, I would just like to share also that there are certain pulmonary conditions that we have to give antibiotic as a, um, as a uh, maintenance therapy. And this is uh, bronchiectasis. This is what I'm referring to. This is actually a condition uh, attributed, could be congenital. We have the William Campbell syndrome, wherein there is uh, bronchial dilatation, congenital bronchial dilatation. But the most common cause of bronchiectasis or a destroyed lung is usually post-infection could either be due to pneumonia or pulmonary tuberculosis. And these patients would have recurrent exacerbations as well, just like asthma. However, um, in this uh, bronchiectasis, there is continuous destruction of tissue structure until such time that all the existing lung parenchyma are being destroyed. And in order to halt this, um, the... Um, guidelines have actually been been uh, recommending the following 
that for children who are chronically infected with Pseudomonas aeruginosa and who have frequent exacerbations, oral macrolides should be used as a maintenance treatment. Azithromycin at 30 milligram per kilogram per week orally divided into daily, thrice weekly or weekly doses with a maximum dose of 1,500 milligrams per week. Evidence showed that this macrolides demonstrated 50% reduction in bronchiectatic exacerbation. Children's antiviral chemoprophylaxis during influenza is a subject of inconsistent and exploratory research. However, oseltamivir is strongly recommended to be started immediately within 36 hours of laboratory confirmed influenza infection. What is the role of surgery in preventing respiratory problems in children? Well, it, has it is being indicated in several conditions. It could be in congenital lung, lung anomalies, um, like in hypoplasia attributed to congenital diaphragmatic hernia, maybe those with congenital lower emphysema, CPAM, and also um, pulmonary AV malformations and so on. And also lung infections. This is actually the more common ones. Pneumonia complicated by pleural effusion or empyema or air leaks. They may warrant CTT tube insertion. And also for post-infection complications, such as in pulmonary tuberculosis, I've mentioned bronchiectasis, ILD or interstitial lung diseases for viral causes of pneumonia, airway anomalies, or maybe there could be a um, narrowing of the airways after prolonged intubation leading to post-intubation subglotic stenosis. These children may warrant preciostomy. The next picture would just like to show us the classic pre presentation of children with diaphragmatic hernia. They would have scaphoid abdomen with barrel chests and would often have difficulty of breathing. The immediate management, of course, is to intubate the patient because you wouldn't want to apply uh, pressure because this would lead to the distension of the abdominal contents, thereby compressing the interthoracic area. And the definitive management of this is, of course, the repair of the obliterated diaphragm. Uh, surgeons would um, attach mesh or sometimes close this um, obliterated part of the diaphragm. What about bronchiectasis? There are certain um, forms of bronchiectasis or stages of bronchiectasis that warrants operation. We have they could have segmentectomy or removal of the section of the lobe, lobectomy, or in worst case scenarios, um, pneumonectomy or removal of, of the complete uh, the complete removal of either the left or the right lung. But of course before we recommend such, we have to do several tests such as um, measurement of the total lung capacity. Um, we request also for spirometry and ventilation perfusion um, uh, tests in order to compute if this patient will be uh, not pulmonary crippled after the operation. What about specific and non-specific immunostimulation? In the form of lysates and bacterial extracts, the evidence available to date does not allow recommendation of the routine use of bacterial lysates for the prevention of RRIs. <laughs> However, there are uh, several lysates, such as OM85, that have demonstrated consistent likelihood of efficacy that can be recommended in selected population of children, but we always have to consider the cost-benefit ratio. Uh, personally, I have, was able to utilize OM85 in my patients with bronchiectatic lung. It is given once daily for 10 days for three consecutive months. That is um, being given in order to decrease the recurrence of respiratory infection. That was the objective actually of the giving of this uh, specific drug. And of course, my experience should be equated with a scientific uh, evidence, but 
uh, of course, um, nowadays, Broncovaxam is no longer available in the Philippine market. But I think uh, adult counterparts, pulmonologists, do uh, give also um, lysates in other forms. Who among you have been asked by this question? Doctora, pwede ba akong humingi ng vitamin sa baga? For sure, most of you, most of us now actually, has been asked with this interesting question. Theoretically, based on the study of Chapaini et al., there is no proof that vitamin A and E deficiency make kids more susceptible to respiratory illnesses. However, there is a mounting evidence that lower vitamin D levels are linked to a rise in viral infections of the respiratory system, especially in the few years of life. It is not viable to advise using vitamin D to prevent recurrent respiratory infections due to the variability of groups that has been investigated and variety of outcomes taken into account. But there may be higher chance of effectiveness in the prevention of RRIs among populations with low socioeconomic status, clearly insufficient levels of vitamin D, and levels with recurrent otitis media. In the Filipino population, um, maybe in the urban areas, we will be having problems with the uh, levels of vitamin D as opposed to that in the rural areas because of, of course, the, um, the uh, sun exposure. No? This is the um, table for the dietary reference intake, both for calcium and vitamin D. And for infants, the adequate intake of vitamin D the, or the average requirement for vitamin D among 0 to 12 months old is said to be 400 international units per day. And uh, we should not exceed the upper limit of the recommendation. And um, daily exposure of, to sunlight during exercise is a very practical way of activating vitamin D3 on the skin and at the same time helps in improving body circulation. It will help, of course, burn fats and even release endorphins or happy hormones. These hormones uh, help relieve pain, um, reduces stress, and also improves the sense of well-being. This would be a very good bonding for the family to exercise under the sun. Maybe they can do it uh, two to three times in a week. The routine vitamin C supplementation shouldn't be utilized in the prevention of, our, of RRIs due to the paucity of research, the variability and small size of the study of the populations uh, uh, that has the population that has been used and also the variety of dosages and the length of therapy. What about um, trace elements in the form of zinc? This has been lengthily discussed by Dr. Sarabeth a while ago. And we know that zinc plays an important role in cell regeneration, immunity, and even growth. Based on the study, there are two schools of thought for the use of uh, trace elements. I would just like to read first, um, discuss first the, uh, the study by Chapini et al. That they, they found out that due to the lack of studies conducted, the heterogeneity of the population studied, the diversity of dosages, formulations, and duration of treatments, zinc, and other trace elements should not be used in the prophylaxis of recurrent respiratory tract infections. Contrary to the statement of the inter-society consensus, the 2021 pickup update stated that zinc supplementation has a role in the prevention of pediatric community-acquired pneumonia. A daily supplementation of 10 mg of zinc as a gluconate or sulfate form for at least four to six months can prevent pneumonia in children aged 2 to 59 months. And again, in uh, low socioeconomic status and clearly insufficient levels of zinc like, our, like the Filipino children, I think zinc is very much uh, recommended. 
And I would just like to show you the recommended daily allowance of zinc. So as you can see, patients um, in five, zero to six months, two milligram per deciliter, seven to 12 months at three and so on. Sa age natin, roughly 12 milligram per deciliter. We cannot discount the fact that hand washing remains to be the most basic yet most effective method of disease prevention. Evidence suggests that washing hands with soap after defecation and before eating can cut the respiratory infection rate by up to 25%. And one study in Pakistan found that hand washing with soap reduced the number of pneumonia-related infections in children under the age of five by more than 50%. By the way, of course, we cannot um, overemphasize that proper hand washing helps prevent the spread of colds and flu by removing viruses that get onto the hands of when we cough or when we sneeze. And this again is a very important reminder, especially during the season of flu. Among the discussed strategies of respiratory disease prevention, I find this the most important and practical of all. One would be parent education, or should I say parent and patient education. Of course, immunization, this is uh, what we do actively as pediatricians, promotion of breastfeeding and nutrition, and um, avoidance of tobacco and nicotine exposure, any form of exposure, and also improve hand washing as one of the best methods to reduce respiratory infections. Definitely, you will agree with me that the silver lining of this pandemic is that people were made aware of the importance of hand washing and proper hygiene and of course following recommended health protocols be it covid or other diseases the steps of prevention still goes back to the basic hand washing wearing of face mask physical distancing avoiding to touch the eyes nose and mouth staying at home when not feeling uh, good covering the nose and mouth when sneezing or coughing, and of course, immediate um, consultation in the event um, you feel unwell, or if the child is unwell, you should be brought to their respective pediatricians immediately. This is my last slide for this evening. As a parting words, I would like, like to emphasize that let us not get tired of imparting knowledge to our patients because these snippets of information can save their lives. Thank you very much for listening. I would just like to remind again that COVID is still here. Keep safe, everyone. And thank you very much for inviting me to be the speaker for this evening. And these are my references. Magandang gabi sa inyong lahat.